With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Hi, welcome back to Heard Tell. Okay, let's go back overseas. Let's continue to talk about this energy crisis because it is worldwide, global, and Germany's right in the center of it for a whole lot of reasons. We're going to talk to Felix Hassa about right now. He joins us from Berlin. Felix, thank you so much for the time, my friend. Good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thrilled to have you. Always enjoy hearing that German accent from having lived over there. I miss the place. Uh, Y'all got some drama on the energy front. Let's start big picture because we've talked about um, we're going to talk about nuclear. We've talked about the gas exports. We know about Russia and Ukraine and Putin putting the screws to Germany and the rest of the EU. We know all that. Let's back up, though, because part of the puzzle that the Western media and Western audience may not know is, you know, one of our founding principles on our program is things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen in a sequence. So a lot of folks on the outside are going, why did Germany let themselves get in this position with drawing down their nuclear power, with making themselves so dependent on Russian gas and other energy sources? Give us that piece of it, the background of this that folks may not know that led up to the current crisis as far as Germany and the EU is concerned. Well, we have to go back very far in time, actually, uh, until the 1970s and 80s. Um, to explain why Germany quit using nuclear power. Back in back in those days, there was a um, large anti-nuclear movement, which was mainly fueled by, by, by fear and under the pressure of the Cold War. Um, so they, they basically um, equated the civil use of nuclear power with nuclear bombs. And after seeing um, the damage that nuclear bombs can do, um, they, they basically were, were afraid and the problem with that movement was that it's very influential. Um, in nineteen in the nineteen seventies, they had a lot of decentral act uh, like decentral groups, uh, decentralized groups, which were organizing their resistance towards the multiple nuclear power plants within Germany. And in nineteen eighty, our Green Party was founded, which was basically um, just those those groups coming together. So right now we have a party which is in parliament and very, very influential in German culture, um, which has as their founding story, as, uh, you know, as, as this myth that they base all the policy on, that they are anti-nuclear. And I alluded to that they were, um, they're very influential in, uh, in politics and parliament, but also in media, mainly in the, the public broadcasting, which we have right now, and um, in, almost in any, um, facet of a society. Now, you mentioned the Green Party, for lack of a better terminology. We've seen the Green Parties in other countries in Europe start to kind of turn around on this a little bit. Belgium's in particular, the Holland, uh, the Netherlands, the Green Party there. They're starting to kind of move away from that a little bit and go, OK, we want to be environmentally friendly. Maybe we can work this out with the nuclear folks a little bit. We're seeing some changes in some other places. Are we seeing that with the Green Party in Germany, though? We do not. I think there was one week uh, where they contemplated when they were basically in panic, um, thinking about, all right, we are in a, we are an energy crunch right now. Um, are we going to abandon our principle of being anti-nuclear? And that discussion was pretty short-lived in the party itself because yeah. they um, they came together and said, we're the Greens, we cannot we cannot let that happen. This is um, we would abandon um, a large share of our of our core voter uh, base. So we cannot let that happen. Now, the the Western perception of Germany, of course, longtime allies of America, friends of America, the perception is everybody thinks of the German people as being practical. Of course, the manufacturing base, very industrial, very um, forward thinking and how to get things done. That sort of a stereotype of the German people. Why is it nuclear is such a bugaboo to the to the folks, especially the Green Party folks? You mentioned it a little bit, the thing from the 70s, but we're two generations from that. Is it just repeated so much that people believe it or is it just ingrained in folks or is there something in this new wave of these new Green Party? The I'm talking to people like 20 to 40, the newer generation of them. Is it just habit or is it something else going on that we're not really aware of? I would say on one hand, it's habit. 
on one hand it's definitely habit um over over this uh, over those you know years when we like let, just for context we phased out our nuclear um we made the decision to phase out our nuclear plans um in 2011. so up until this point nuclear power was running uh very smoothly and nobody really worried about it um we did that under the impression of fukushima but under the surface the anti-nuclear and the, or the nuclear skepticism had been growing since the 70s and 80s and you said that germany is always seen as this very efficient non-emotional uh, approach to you know doing doing business and doing industry and producing however there's there's a slight caveat to that i think that um after after the second world war we never really had any um drastic disruptive innovation coming up basically also not even like going back even even um earlier than that so the the industriousness that germany is is, is known for is a thing of the past and right now we're we're basically um having this dreamer like attitude that we are still a rich country that we are basically um you know just feeding off of our of the innovation that we did roughly 100 years ago and when you're in a country which does not realize why it is rich um then you end up with with policies which um basically go against what made us rich for example cheap energy and that you know nuclear comes with that this is interesting though because um Maybe this is one of those things where we talk about maybe the culture is dictating the politics more than the other way around. We're going to talk about the policy side of this and what you wrote about in just a minute. But talk about the generational change, because I think I think you're hitting on something important here because you talked about disruption. Well, the last real big disruption in Germany before this current crisis was reunification, which was a massive economic change. They had to absorb the Eastern Germans. Um, that was the same time the U.S. did massive drawdowns, which changed their economic situation. That was a big period of change in Germany, but we're too, we're over a generation away from that now. So this new generation is probably not really thinking of those things. They really haven't had a major economic disruption. The EU's ran pretty smoothly until this Putin invading Ukraine thing. They really kind of had a bit of a bubble of, of good times and good economy and things going well. Is that part of the problem here is that culturally this is kind of the first crisis for the current generation of a whole lot of germans and a lot of the eu in general i always say that germany is too rich germany is too rich to appreciate freedom and prosperity and innovation um right now we we are basically um living off the uh, you know the fruits of our or of previous of previous decades and even centuries um we have had high energy prices um, but we've been rich enough to basically not notice them. Obviously, the lower classes in our society have been have been struggling under the highest energy prices which are in the world right now. Um, but the the middle classes and the upper middle classes who are overly represented in media and in culture have not felt the pain. And now this has changed, right? This has changed um, since um, since the invasion of Ukraine. And since the um, ru uh, the Russian gas is likely to be uh, not flowing next next winter, yeah, and this is the core of this problem: is winter's coming, and there's nothing yes. you're going to do to stop winter from coming. Are people cognizant of that? Is there a sense of urgency to do something about any of this? Now we've seen a little bit of movement on the nuclear front. They've talked about you know not shutting down what they haven't shut down yet, that sort of thing. But really, you talked about this. This is we're dealing with policy that was set in 2011. So, you know, almost 10, 11, 12 years ago now. Is there really that much they can do at this late hour to slam the brakes on this thing? So there is a sense of urgency within the population. Um, the amount of firewood that has been stolen from the forests is going is going up. Um, the, the prices, the prices of um, of. I would say like you know the prices of gas the prices of 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 oil 
is, is going up because people are afraid that they cannot heat their homes in the winter. So within the population, there is a strong sense of urgency. And this is usually um, this is not reflected in the urgency of, for example, that the Greens feel right now. Um, some other parties which are in the, in the governing coalition, like the SPD and the FDP, um, they kind of voice a sense of urgency there, but they are in a coalition with the Greens together. Um, so I, I guess they would have, they would be more vocal if they weren't, if they weren't in the coalition. Yeah. And for the American audience and the international audience that aren't familiar with parliamentarian politics, uh, Olaf Schultz's ruling coalition, they call it the traffic signal coalition, uh, green, yellow, red, just kind of break that down for a second, because that's the current ruling party. It's a brand new ruling party after a long tenure of Angela Merkel, say whatever you want, but it was stable for a long, long time. This is a lot of new on top of everything else, and that's part of the story as well, isn't it? Yes, for sure, for sure. It has been. It's a very uh, novel way of doing politics in Germany. It's a, first and foremost, it's a it's a three party coalition, which is uh, which is new on the federal level. Um, we do have the, um, the the majority within that coalition has is the SPD, which is the Social Democrats. Um, those have been um, usually they they have been actually running on on the ticket that nothing really changed for some for some reason they managed uh to be associated with a continuity that was actually appreciated under uh under the merkel government so olaf schultz was a part of that um too for a long time and he managed to just have this this sense of of continuity and this is why he became the chancellor the other parties and there are the greens and the classical liberal, like the liberal Democrats, um, coming to the Greens, they are um, they are new to government. They had been in government uh, when when Gerhard Schröder, or or the, the Chancellor before Merkel was in uh, was in uh, power, and they were um, polling very well before the election, and there were some even some rumors that they could actually. Um, that the chancellor could be from the green party that didn't materialize because uh, schultz was had a pretty good um had a pretty good last couple of weeks before the election but the greens have never been this strong and influential uh in in, in german politics and those those parties are um i would say could be considered left wing and then you have the odd party in that coalition which are, which are the classical liberals the the free democrats and uh, those represent more of a, of a centrist, of a centrist, um, pol uh, centrist politics. They, yeah, they have, they have classical liberal values. Um, however, they find it very, very tough against those two left parties to actually um, make a mark on, on, on policy. And this is the current situation which we're having. Yeah. Uh, we're talking to our friend Felix Hasse. Uh, we're going to continue to talk about the German politics. We're going to talk about uh, Chancellor Olaf Schultz, the Schultz machine. We're going to get into why he's called that and the policy. Also get back to his piece he wrote. We're going to get into some of the numbers, nuclear by the numbers. Why was it a public panic that put this whole thing together? What they're going to do about it? Talking more about nuclear energy with our friend over in Germany. Her tale continues right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Felix Haas joining us from over in Berlin, talking a little energy, talking some nuclear. Um, we're talking about policy and politics and culture all colliding when it comes to nuclear. Anytime you have those three together, you need to go to leadership. The current leadership and Chancellor of Germany is Olaf Scholz. We talked about his party, but let's talk about the man for a minute. Again, you know, he's good, bad, or indifferent, whatever you thought of Angela Merkel. She'd been there a long time. They had a lot of stability. They had a lot of economic success. She was a major player on the world stage, especially when it came to Russia and her evolution about Russia um, over the years. He's an unknown quality to a lot of people. We've got some book on him now. He's been in power for a couple of months. 
What are people thinking about Olaf Scholz when it comes to this energy crisis? In terms of style, he basically continues the style of Angela Merkel. Um, the, Angela Merkel has been successful in, in ruling Germany, or had been successful in ruling Germany for such a long time, by having a style which basically focuses on not rocking the boat, not doing any major um, reforms which would be needed, and basically governing based on polls. So try to try to do not what is necessary, but what is right now in this moment um, politically, um, politically like like which like the opportunity is there and which people appreciate in this particular moment. So Olaf Scholz has the same has the same style. However, he does not have. Um, there is no emotional connection like we had with Merkel. He's a very, um, he's a very, you know, bland character, and he doesn't get he doesn't get the 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 emotion that we had to uh, Mutti Merkel, which means mother mother Merkel, which some some Germans called her. So that's that's his that's his government style. He does not rock the boat, and this particular um style gets very interesting if you are in a coalition with two other parties because then you um do not exactly pick sides when um some coalition parties have their their pet projects their their you know their topics um for example the greens um having having the nuclear uh the topic of nuclear power um there he doesn't pick uh, any sides and he just lets them run with it this is the current situation of leadership in regards to nuclear now you've got people like you mentioned and alluded to before some of these other parties this is a coalition government they're openly talking about if this winter gets ugly if the crisis gets worse he's going to have problems with his coalition what's he saying what's he pitching the german people right now because they're looking at the calendar we're deep into august here it's getting cold up there you know those cold rainy german winters are no joke i've been through them what's he telling the people what's the pitch to the people who are concerned about this issue right now? The interesting fact is that Scholz doesn't pitch anything. Uh, Scholz basically uh, lets his, like, that's the ministers uh, govern, which is the Minister of Economy, the Minister of Finance, and the Minister of Ecology. Um, for those, for those, he just, you know, he just lets them um, fight it out uh, amongst themselves. The interesting thing is that the Minister of Finance is from the um, free Democrats, so the classical liberal party, and the Minister of Economy is of the um, is of the Green Party. So there is a there is a uh, a conflict which he basically just you know mo removes himself from and uh, lets them lets them fight it out. Yeah, that doesn't sound like leadership to me. But what do I know? Maybe he knows something about it. I don't know. Um, the other piece of this is always renewable energy. It ain't from lack of trying. Germany has spent enormous funds, enormous infrastructure, and they've been doing it for a long time. They were early adapters on it. I'm looking at the background on my computer screen right now is a picture from, you know, 2008 that we took because we would drive up on the, the hills above where we lived in Schoenberg, Kugelberg, and it's just windmills as far as you can see on top of the hill. It's one of my favorite pictures. My daughter took it. That's the background on my computer I'm looking at now. That was a long time ago. They've been doing renewable energy for a long time. Has Germany got the investment back from that that they thought they would get? About uh, about renewable energy, we have been doing large investments in solar and wind, um, and it's not for a lack of trying. Our basic enemy in German energy policy is basic physics. Um, the The problem with wind and solar is that there are times when the wind is not blowing and the sun's not shining, and while when the wind blows and the sun shines, we have um, we have the energy from those sources in the times when they, you know, when we do not have the energy, we have to rely on other sources. So actually, with the, um, we started off with the intention of becoming more green and more nuclear, but our, for example, our carbon emissions are much higher than the um, surrounding countries because, quite frankly, we do not have as much nuclear in our energy mix. So we were, um, for a long time living the dream um in energy policy and we we woke up roughly a half a year ago yeah abruptly thank you vladimir putin 
Um, I, I seem like I ask this question every time we talk about nuclear on the program with every guest on nuclear. I'm going to phrase it this way because you wrote about it in your piece. You talked about the Green Party's opposition. You wrote that it is largely white collar opposition characterized by a lack of understanding of the energy demands of private enterprise and how increased energy prices affect working class people. Also, all this high tech stuff that Germany's trying to get in on, trying to be the leading edge on in Europe, massive outliers of power to to do things like that, even in things like there was news today about the the semiconductor industry in Taiwan, how it's just massive power drains to do these sorts of things. Germany's going to need power if it's going to remain the economic engine of not just Germany, the entire EU relies on Germany. That's just the facts of it. How in the world are we going to have a conversation with those white collar folks in the Green Party like you talked about to breach the gap of like, hey, we have data. This nuclear energy is clean. If you care about the environment, nuclear energy is the best option to get the most power possible for the cleanest energy possible. But there just seems to be this force field around it where they don't want to hear it or we're not communicating it well enough, those of us that advocate for it. So this is the question I always ask every time we talk about energy. How do we change that? How do we get that conversation changed so that one side or the other starts meeting in the middle a little bit here? I think we have to start off by realizing that this white collar, um, the, the group of white collar people, this this so-called intelligentsia and mostly of civil servants who are very supportive of the Greens are in a minority. So what we first and foremost need is the majority to stand up and say, we, we do not let you dictate our energy policy. That's the first thing that should happen. Um, the second thing is that they should get into a position where even they realize that energy is too expensive and this will come in the next winter i i i guarantee you the price increases are already very drastic and they're expected to be astronomical so the this is this is what what needs to what needs to happen and quite frankly we need a lot of um change coming from from society we need to um point the finger exactly at who's responsible for this, which is the, 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 green, the green mainstream currently. And this is the only, this is the only re, um, way by raising the societal pressure um, on how we can get out of this. Here's the tough question, and this is going to be some pronostication, so just do your best with it. But if this thing gets ugly, if Putin really does turn off all the gas like he's probably going to threaten to do because he's going to want concessions and he's going to want to put the pressure on Ukraine. If if this gets really ugly, when people get hurt and people get scared, they're not always rational. The German people, we know the policy. We know where the government stands. We know where the EU stands. We know where America and the allies stand. The German people, if they start really feeling the bite of this thing, what direction is that anger and frustration going to get aimed at? Is it going to be at Schultz? Is it going to be at Putin? Where is this going to land at? We're right now facing a problem that we are currently we're currently facing the consequences um, of the of the sanctions um, towards Russia, which I think are are right. We should have those sanctions, um, but the German the German public is already feeling um, sort of fatigue. They are fed up with the war and the support for Ukraine is actually um, sort of currently shrinking. So this is this is the, the first the first thing I, I see right now. Um, they are directing their anger towards the government and saying why why is this our war? And um, I could go into why this is and this should be um, you know a priority of Germany to have the Ukrainians win this war. But um, we lose sight of the fact that our government brought us in this situation in the first place and that the the war of Russia in Ukraine is only a contributing factor. So what it, it should be directed towards towards the people who are currently opposing nuclear power, but um, it's currently directed towards the people who still support the sanctions. And I think this is a this is a grave mistake. In order to, um, in order to, you know, I, I, I'm not expecting 
the, the Germans to go out on the street in mass. This has just not been a German thing to do. Um, if it gets way worse, then, um, then we might be surprised that they uh, go on the streets, but it's not exactly likely. Yeah, Felix Haas, uh, one last question on this front. Um, you talk about sound energy policy in your piece. This would require consistency. We've talked about how this has been going on since the 70s. It's kind of ingrained in German culture at this point. Is the big trap here going to be, well, if we just figure out this thing with Putin, all our problems are going to go away, and that's going to be the false hope because you're still going to have this underlying energy crisis underneath. Is there a little bit of a trap forming here? 100%. 100%. We are in this situation not because of Putin, but because of the irrational fear and in a way the decadence of the last of the last governments and of our public um we are here because we lost sight of why it is important to have clean and reliable and cheap energy and for and for the like for the politicians it's always very very easy to blame putin on this but energy cri energy prices were the highest uh in europe before the war started and before anyone could think of sanctions and um, decreases in the amount of gas delivered. Yeah, Felix Haas, it's universal. It doesn't matter the country, the language or the situation. We tend to make our own messes and make sure we blame somebody else so we don't have to deal with it. Uh, I'm sure our German friends are going to have that same problem with energy crisis because we're doing that within the States by ourselves right now. Felix Haas, a great information. Really appreciate it. We'll have you back again until we see you again on Hertel, though. Let folks know where they can follow you, what you have going on until they see and hear from you again, my friend. Awesome. Um, the easiest way to find me is on Twitter, but um, it's the it's the free Felix. That's my Twitter handle. But I'd like to direct you uh, to uh, my think tank. I, I recently found it, which is called the Ego Institute. Our website is ego-institute.org. And we are a think tank which gives people perspective on how they can live a freer life by doing easy steps and not rely on the government to make them more free because history has shown that this usually doesn't work out that way and um, we try to give people some guidance on how to live a more free and flourishing life there yeah we'll link to all that we'll put all that in his social media is on the screen if you're watching on the youtube and we will put all those in the show notes including his piece in sustainability times on nuclear make sure you read the whole thing for yourself there's some links in there too you need to make sure you check out make up your own mind and we'll continue to talk about this issue because it ain't going away and like the show's famous for saying winter's coming my friend and this is going to get real real dicey i'm afraid uh felix hosser appreciate your time my friend we'll talk again soon thank you so much for having me thank you sir Welcome back to Herd Tell. We're, we're having a good time talking about it, but it's a tough topic and you got to laugh to get through the hard times. Uh, Grace and Francis are joining us. Chris, you just heard her talk about some of it. <laughs> you know, there's the old misquote that's lived in legend about, you know, the death of a man is a tragedy, a million people, that's a statistic. But that's what you have to do here. You've got to try to funnel that kind of story, that kind of human tragedy, put it, not only put it through a funnel, but let's be honest as Americans, we're, we're the privileged people of the earth. How do you funnel that down and get it to people where something like losing your freedom, it's almost like a foreign language you're trying to explain to people that have, you know, especially since we're doing it a lot through multimedia, we're doing it through the internet. So this is a class of people that have a little bit of privilege. How do you even start telling that story and filtering it down and getting it in front of people? And like, you need to pay attention to this because not only is it a tragedy to the people happening, it's a cautionary tale to what will happen in the rest of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, if we're talking about being indisputable, we're talking about personal stories. So that's why we sought out uh, people, dissidents with um, with firsthand experience, firsthand understanding uh, of what's been happening in their home countries. Um, you know, people can sit and listen to a history class. People can sit and listen to a lecture. 
Um, people can listen to a professor speak on a subject, but unless somebody has personal experience, specifically when they're speaking to young children or children in high school, um, it's not going to resonate the way that somebody who protested in Hong Kong and has their umbrella with them is going to resonate uh, with younger audiences. So that's why we we focused the program the way that we did. Francis, for the for the international audience, I know the umbrella thing became really the symbol of the, of the 2019 movements. Um, I hate to phrase it this way, but there's, you know, look, I'm a military guy. The first thing that strikes you is the futility of it. And then the second part that hits you is the, the absolute human bravery of it of like, I know this is futile, but it's all I got. So by God, this is what I'm using. You were there, you know, these people, you talk to them. That's the symbol we picked up on. Is that a sim? How did that symbolism work for the people of Hong Kong as well? Of like, this is basically our last resort, but this is what we got. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the movements in Hong Kong really broke out without any planning. I would say maybe the organizer has think about it, but for a grassroots or for a grassroots movement like as huge as that, people. O were only there because they want to protest and, and oppose a certain bills, right? And they wouldn't imagine it would eventually broke out into a mass movement, like two million people would go onto the streets and it lasted for, you know, months and almost a year. And at the at the very first time when people were on the streets, they were only, you know, they were thinking it's only a march, it's only a rally. And when we live in that freedom for so long from our mind it's so simple like we're just going to be on the streets and chanting and marching all that kind of stuff so people only you know hong kong always rains and people always have an umbrella in their backpack and that's the only thing that people can defend for themselves so when something violent happened they only pull out the th only things that they have to protect themselves and you can see that from that it's so powerful because you you know for sure no one was there uh intended to to start anything violent and the only the the reason why they only pull out an umbrella it's because that's the only resource that's the only thing that it, they have and you know it's it's so sim this is this become a symbol um, in 2014, um, when the occupying movement started, um, there was just one day that people were on the streets and the police start to launch um, tear gas and, um, and pepper spray to people. And they have to use something to basically show themselves. So you can see people were didn't plan to start anything violent. And all they want to do is to protect themselves against the weapons and against police force and you can see i don't know if you have seen like videos of the umbrella movement um there are umbrellas that's they people start to send from the back to the front to the front line and you can see all everything is like started in a group and people are just using team efforts um and we became like a like like a group of people like strangers um, became a group of people of force and a group of people with power. They work together and to protect themselves, they became like a community. Um, that's something very powerful and really strikes me when I was watching that video. And and I, I'm sure a lot of other people who later joined the movement was very moved by the video too, was very moved by people who were standing on the front line. Um, and this become a symbol um, for the international community to recognize what's happening in Hong Kong. And this become also became something, you know, very influential that a lot of, of other uh, street protests in other countries also took reference to. And it happened in Thailand and in a lot of other movements around the world. And, you know, that's something we have. And, and many people just took reference of it. And we're very glad that this becomes something that people recognize. Um, but it's, you know, it's so powerful because umbrella, it's, it, it can, it can look weak, but when it's, it's all together, it can become a shield against, um, police force against something so powerful.
Yeah. And Grace, when you're detailing this down for, you know, school age, young people, high school kids, especially, you know, maybe some young college kids, that sort of age group. I mean, that's, that's almost like a children's parable when you think about it. If you just pulled it out of the blue sky and told it, it's like, oh, that's some kind of a parable for a teaching moment. Yeah. But this really happened. And it not only happened, we got it on high definition video. Yeah. I mean, th this is like this is this is living history that we just experienced. How do we keep it in the public consciousness? Because the media's already moved on from this story. You you hardly ever hear about Hong Kong in U.S. media right now, Western media. Yeah, even even you know BBC and Sky News that has bureaus there. You hardly ever hear anything about the protests anymore. And I watch it every day. How do you use those stories and that video and the stories of Grace and others and start getting it into these kids so that the next generation already has it inculcated into them? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's the point of the dissident project, right? Um, if the generations who are controlling the media uh, now aren't focused on it, then how do we how do we uh, rectify that situation? We go to younger generations and we we change the way that people will tell this story moving forward. That's the whole point of the dissident project, and it's incredibly important. Francis, you talked about. Um you know, having hope and then having no hope. We watched it from afar, so we see the full sequence of events. For the people in Hong Kong, it was probably a very different in how they perceive things. When was the moment that they they really knew that, you know, China had the full control and this was going to get bad? Was it the judicial reforms? Was it shutting down the free press? Uh, a lot of people that we talked to in Western media, they said when they canceled the Tiananmen vigil, which is always a big, big deal in Hong Kong, when yeah. they canceled that and didn't get a lot of pushback, that's kind of when they knew. When was it for you and, and for the folks there? When was one of the two, the mile post where they went, OK, this, this is going to get bad? I would say for me, it's it's two thing, two events. The first is the when the national security law was implemented in Hong Kong. Um, that happened in July 2020 after the, the protest in 2019. Um, that's the thing that when at the first time when um, we see a law from China being imposed in Hong Kong and without any any consent or without any process of consulting the community or the people it completely bypassed the legislative body um it's really a law that was passed by the people's of Con uh, people's congress and uh, of the ccp and implemented in hong kong and it was a news that was they only published they only announced this news in june which is one month before the implementation of the law and people start to wonder like how effective or how are they going to going to enforce this law like how big it is going to cover is it going to trace back to what people have done before um does that mean saying you know advocating for hong kong independence or you know as simple as supporting democracy in hong kong would be criminalized right um so there is like a, a people there is like a feeling of uncertainty all around the city and then when they really when they have the first arrestee of the national security law that's when people start to realize okay that's the boundary that's that's a red line but still even though you can see you know a very blurry red line it, it's still like very it's still something it's it it's like I don't know if people can see that as an indicator of what they can do or not, because they can change the rule anytime. And then when they arrest someone for something that they have done in the past, people start to wonder, oh, my God, like, so all of my involvement in the 2019 movement can be can become an evident. Um, and and so eventually there is like a feeling of white terror a, a self-censorship in the city and people would be like as i said as i mentioned earlier when you go into social media they don't even know if they can share this news because that can be one of the evidence against them and um i think the the implementation of the nsl really strikes the city and completely um 
completely demolish the freedom and what we have developed in the past. Um, and that was also one of the reasons why I left Hong Kong. And I would say the second events that happened and it really br brought people down would be the arrest of the 47 um, uh, pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. Um, they were arrested all, all of the sudden in one morning. And the court e couldn't even handle so many people. They couldn't even handle to have trials on, on these people. And they just didn't plan it. They just wanted to arrest everyone who have any who have so much influence in the city. And after they were arrested, basically all kinds of civil activities and protests or any sort of resistance stopped right there. Because these people are are the people who initiate campaigns and uh, and look at policies and speak up against the government. And when these leaders were arrested, basically the people do not know what they can do. And because there is the 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 scariest the scariest part is that they have a hotline to report things. So if you if anyone witnessed or hear overheard any conversations that deemed to violate the national security law, they can report it to the hotline, and the police would come to your door and arrest you. And so there is also the the hope the trust that was built between the community is gone now and the only thing that people can do to live a okay life in hong kong is to only care about living but not to care about what's going on in the city and what's going on around them so i would say that's the two things that really strikes me in, in the people of hong kong francis and grace are joining us from this and project we're going to take another quick break when we come back continue to talk about Hong Kong. How do you teach these lessons? What to learn from them? We're going to talk a little bit more about authoritative dictatorships from firsthand knowledge, communism, socialism, because we throw those terms around. We need to be real specific what we're talking about. More with Francis and Grace right after this. It's a very special Hurt Tale continues. We might have heard tell Grace is joining us. Francis is joining us. They're both from the Dissident Project. Um, Grace, real quick, we just heard her, you know, more of her story and what's going on in Hong Kong. It's not just Hong Kong. We have multiple people in the Dissident Project um, from all over different parts of the world. The theme that goes across all of these, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's North Korea, authoritative dictatorships who need power and they have to crush dissent and they have to crush other people's freedoms to keep that power. This is universal through human history. It's always going to be this way throughout human history, I think. How do you tell that part of the story that, hey, this isn't just some ideological term we throw around on social media. This is a part of the human experience for as long as we have recorded human history. And it's happening right now to real life people that through technology you can talk to like Francis. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think in addition to, uh, you know, the dissidents telling their personal stories, which is uh, an incredibly important part of this, um, they also talk about the technical details of uh, how these authoritarian governments uh, begin, how they take over, um, how socialism leads to communism, the economic, the economic implications of these systems uh, for the citizens of their home countries. Um, and so it's not just uh, that they're telling their personal stories, but they really are reaching back into history and talking about how these things happen, um, how uh, people groups become oppressed, uh, how countries fall into authoritarian rule. And Francis, we know the history of how Hong Kong fell under authoritative rule. We know, you know, it was British. Now the Chinese have control of it. What's the future? And I don't I don't want to be bleak about it, but, you know, the, the Communist Chinese Party is very ingrained. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. 
what's the immediate future of Hong Kong? Are, are they going to get even more freedoms taken away? What's the status right now today? Because like we mentioned before, the Western media has kind of stopped covering it, unfortunately. Since probably the, the 2019 where we had those visual things, what's been going on since then and what do you anticipate in the near future? Well, as I said, on a, on a civil activity level, there's none. There's no um, protest going on in the streets. Um, and But then I also want to mention that I think there are still resistance uh, among the people. You know, you can't you can shut people's mouth like all of a sudden and erase their memories. I think that's something we can hold hope on. And um, when there is such a huge... Um, oppression that exists in, in the city, that's when arts start to evolve and that's when create like creation starts to come out and we see many people start to um, pay more attention to local arts and local music and you know just everything that's coming out from Hong Kong because they know that's what they can what our national identity is contained to. Um, and they start to embrace more about the local culture and that's how they practice and how they really lift their identity out as a Hong Konger. So you see there are a lot of different art, different um, special unique things that comes out from the city and our part in XL is to promote about it and to you know amplify that um because the people back people in hong kong they do not get as much exposure and attention as they have before um and i think even now like within arts you can see people's voice are continue they are continuing to speak up and 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 to to, and to say the values they 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 want to embrace so um when you look at little things and basically things that comes out from the city it's very it's just amazing and i i think um that's the thing that we can look forward to and who knows like i think back in 2014 i didn't imagine that something as big as as massive as the 2019 movement would happen so perhaps we can have hope that in the future something like that could happen even and and something even bigger we don't know and i can only tell you that you know for people like us outside we have the responsibility to amplify their voice and to uh, continue to bring attention to them and that's why i'm with the dissident project because i want to tell the story of hong kong basically all the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com